Man, I don't mean to scream, but I, I well, Jesus. When I'm soccer coach, one, one thing the parents always have to learn, you know, the first thing you got to learn about me is I get excited. No matter if we're winning or losing. As long as my player makes a good play, I'm like, yeah. One time we won a big match and, and we were rained out. So the, the soccer field was covered with water. I was the first one as coach to run and do a Pete Rose slide right across the 50-yard line. Head to toe covered in mud. Had to strip down buck naked to get into the truck and go home. True story. Why? I want to be enthusiastic about things in my life. I want to show people that, you know what? Take off the limitation of reserve. Sometimes you just need to full throttle and enjoy life. Amen? Watch this. Joshua 1-2. It opens up with this bold statement. Moses, my servant, is dead. How would you like to be Joshua? Be like, thanks, God. Like, I got a clue of that. God, we had to take his body. and prepare. We understand he's dead. There's nothing pretty about death, my friend. It's the absence of life. But to the believer, it's the beginning of eternal life. Does that make sense? So the opening statement of the book is, Moses, my servant, is dead. Do you know most people camp out in their Christian walk right there? I serve a dead Jesus. Oh, the tomb. I love when they get that vibrato in there. Oh! It's like it makes it more spiritual. See, death in and of itself profits very little. But when death and then it comes back to life, wow. An incredible, an incredible feat there. Look at this. So he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now they've been walking with Moses for some 40 years. And he fell over dead. Right? Right? Or, and, and he informed them that, he's, that he was dead. He actually, their departure was he went on a mountain and they left them. So the, the next generation of leadership could take them where God wanted them to go. So here's the word. Most of my servant is dead. And watch, God never leaves anything in darkness. God never leaves anything dead. He always resurrects it. He always speaks beyond the grave. Amen? Look what he says. Now, therefore, I like this, arise. Why? Because there's a time and a season to mourn, but it's not all the time. There's a time to rejoice. That's what the Word says. There is a time to, to mourn, and mourning has its place. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to diminish that. We've all lost loved ones, and, and, and it has an impact in our life. No question about it. And there is that time and space we, we should mourn. We should let it have its, its time frame. But that's not all the time and forever. Yeah. Amen? Look, because the next word that he says, arise. What's he saying? Change your point of view. Change your point of view. Now, I've talked about physical death. Let's talk about the spiritually dead. The spiritually dead, even if they were a Christian label. I've observed this over the years. You can have the label of Christian and still be dead. It's because your point of reference goes to a day that you said the great confession. And the further that becomes in your history, you see very little, um, very little value of it. If, if I could say it that way. You see that its intrinsic value is diminishing. It becomes the plane ticket to heaven instead of the lifestyle I'm to live in earth. Does that make sense? Watch where this goes. Just watch. When, when we die spiritually, we surrender. Hear me right now. If you don't let the spark ignite inside of you and the fire start to burn and then it be the, 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 I don't know, what's the next part of the, 
When a, sty- when a fire starts to burn, you guys are looking at me like a mule looking at a new gate. There it is. It starts to spread. I knew it would come well, if I just meddled in it long enough. Then it starts to spread. And that's the cool thing about fire. That's what's cool about the igniting of a flame inside of you is it has the potential to spread. Amen? Watch this. So he calls them to change their reference point, their viewpoint. The person that has no hope for the future is a person that is so focused on the present condition, they literally make it their grave. The trouble of my present becomes my grave, my tomb. The person that's depressed, they're depressed. All right, look at the word and break it down. Depressed. Something, some force, some thought, some attitude, some input is pushing them down. You have a crease in your pants. Why? Because they were depressed under a hot iron. You ladies that have faux painting in your house, you ever sponge or rag? I used to do it in our house. That's what you did. What is it? It's depress. To depress. It means to take a form of another item and push it into or onto another item. To press. Ever hear the word die cast? What is it? It's a stamp that hits metal or material so hard it leaves an impression the enemy wants to hit your life and lifestyle so hard it leaves an impression he wants you to be depressed suppressed what suppressed comes from the word subterrain mean help push you into the grave prematurely do you hear me and god's kingdom's totally the opposite it's impression Not suppression. The word creates an impression in you. And the impression is so you can live it out. Big difference. An impression calls you to become into something, calling you up into something, if that makes sense. I hope I impress you. That means the the viewpoint that I'm giving you today, you come into and live and receive. Big difference. Right? So he's calling them to arise. And then he says, go over this Jordan. Notice he says, this Jordan. So that lets me understand that there may be other Jordans. What Jordan are you looking at today? What Jordan are you facing? What Jordan have you crossed? What Jordan are you still trying to cross? Just keep that in your pipe for for a moment. Watch this. Then he goes on to say, you and all this people. And then he calls them to why they're arising. To the land which I'm giving to them. Notice the word here is not gave. It's giving. Perpetual. God's promises to you and I are perpetuated on a daily basis. The promise spoke thousands of years ago is just as vital, just as uh, real today as it was back then. It didn't diminish in power. It didn't diminish in its ability to serve you. Notice the words. It's in present tense. Giving to them. Not gave to them, giving to them. Watch this. The next generation church is a people that will arise and go. They push limits and boundaries. The previous generation is always challenged by the next generation. Why? They take your intel, look over it, revise it, if you will, and create something totally different out of it. The one church in the one era of time thought it was ungodly to have musical instruments in the building. Well, if God wanted us to have guitars, I'd be a guitar. Instead, he gave me my hands to clap, my foot to stomp. But Jethro used to go and blow in his whiskey jug once it was empty. And that became a bass. Right? I'm talking about my family now. So not only was his foot stomping, but he figured out, I've now drank all my moonshine. (laughs) So he started to blow in there. Like you used to with the Pepsi glass bottles. You ever do that as a kid? Like, that's what happened. Jethro did that. 
He goes, good God, Melly, I think I got a new beat. <laughs> and before you know it, bluegrass was birthed, and it became, in the church I grew up in, the only kind of anointed music of God. And we rallied around that so that whenever drums came in and whenever loud guitars like, wow, sound like a, a chainsaw. Oh, that's ungodly. People get demons in their head with those guitars. True story. But the tambourine, you know, Billy Bob and Betty, they know how to play that tambourine. We'd go into churches, my wife would hide them. Because it's annoying to me. Like, get rid of that garbage. Dear Jesus. One tambourine, good. Fifty, bad. Right? Good to see you. Yeah. So, what is it? I'm going to show you. Well, we, a generation took it a little further. Fighting the opinion of the previous generation. Now, all of a sudden, we got this club music. It's like, zoop, zoop, like holy smoke. I can't wait until we can have lights and everything. I'm serious. I want those lights that fly, flash this way. Yeah. They're like white lights and they go, and your eyes go, heck yeah. I will be the only 70-year-old preacher you'll ever know that will still do stage dives and slides. So we won't have carpet on our stage. I don't want carpet burns. True story. True story. Like one of my friends overseas went to do a stage dive. And his ushers just looked at him and he caught him by surprise, jumped off of a huge stage and broke his pelvis bone. He's like, you know, I asked him where he was. I go, so what'd you get out of it? He said, oh, God, hell, I don't know. That's what he said. <laughs> Went to the hospital. True story. As a pastor of one of the largest churches in that part of Europe. A stage dive, big stage. I'm like, dude. Hello. If you're going to do a stage dive, if you want to do a, what do they call that, crowd surf, make sure there's a crowd that's willing to catch. See, when he was younger, is guess what? Those, those ushers, they were on their A game. Like, yeah. They got older and settled in. It's like, oh, he don't do that anymore. Just drink your latte. Pastor dives, splat! Pastor, our pastor went to Australia. They were jumping off the rafters of the church on bungee cords. I'm talking way up there, Coliseum level high. He came back and went, Darren, we got vibrant praise and worship, but you will not believe what I just saw. I'm like, Pastor Scott, I fly an airplane, me no jump with bungee. <laughs> Don't happen, I'll watch, I'll film it. True story. My question is, what limitation are you operating under that you're trying to seed into the next generation. Never teach your kids to live under your limitations. Do not limit their faith because faith is ever growing. See, I learned this early on. There's a generation on the planet that believes stubs can grow new legs. No eyes, God can form them in the socket. And they're having those kind of miracles. You may not have ever had one, and you may have not ever performed one or worked one, but it does not mean God is not doing it. Amen? Moving on. Look at this. They mourned for 30 days over the, the loss of Moses. But see, while they were mourning and recognizing death, the promise was still living. What focal point will consume your thoughts? I'll never forget when I lost my grandfather. He was, he was the man that taught me a lot as, as growing up. Spent a lot of time with him in the mountains. Um, and watch this. When he died, I'll never forget preaching his funeral. I couldn't do it physically. I, I literally could not do it. The burden was so great. And I remember when I grabbed the lectern, the Spirit of God, I felt the Spirit of God just come upon me suddenly, almost like it came into me, if that makes sense. And I started speaking, and I guess I, I ministered for over an hour. I didn't even realize one word that I had said when I went home. 
See, what am I trying to tell you? You can make death your celebration. You can make death your life and lifestyle. Or you can make life your lifestyle. To the Gothic person, don't judge them so harshly. They're trying to identify with something. Find out what it is and help them identify with something greater. Amen? Most of the time it's just attention. So when I'm in a restaurant and somebody walks up and they have these plates in their ear, I'm like, my goodness, did you steal my saucer? Come on now. Because size, you know, big is better in that world. I'm like, did you take my saucer? Can I have it back, please? And they look at me and they'll, they, they, they just start laughing. One girl had piercings and when she smiled, in her gums she had piercings. Like that. And I'm like, just smile. Your teeth's prettier than the piercing. And I kept haranguing her like that and teasing her in a good way. Not belittling her, but just getting to know her. She started telling me, oh, I got all kinds of piercings. I, okay, I just need to see those when you smile. That's all. We'll just keep it right there. But watch. I started to talk to her, and she said, oh, so you're a pastor. Yeah. Really? And I started to talk to her about the Old Testament and some of the things in there she had never heard at church. One day I go in to get my Starbucks. She's, Darren, guess what? I'm like, would you stop smiling at me? <laughs> and I'm, you know, because I was still half asleep. I'm like, why are, you, why are you looking at me like that? She goes, do you notice anything? I go, did you have braces before? <laughs> you know? She goes, no, my piercings are gone. She literally pierced inside of her lips. So when she did, you could see the piercings underneath her lips. I went, oh, my God. She says, look at my ears, Darren. She'd taken all of them out. She had one up here, gone. I said, what happened? She said, you know, we talked. And she said, all of a sudden, I just felt I didn't need this anymore. I didn't need this anymore. I'm so excited, Darren. She's plugged into another church. I'm so excited. And Darren, I'm getting into the management program for Starbucks. See, what is it? You can point it out and hammer it and drive them away, or you can point that uniqueness out and give them something greater, which is it. Amen? We became sin aware because the preachers of old, that's all they talked about. But in our generation, we became righteous aware, grace aware, faith aware, mercy aware. So the message has changed just a little bit. Didn't mean we went, walked away from truth. We just got a greater revelation. Does that make sense? Amen? So look at this. Old mentalities, are like, uh, old mentalities like to camp out and protect a movement of previous generations or personalities of the past. But we must keep going and growing. Put that in your notes. One way that you know you're not dead is you keep going and growing. Like I tell Drop, Drop, there's times that, yes, I, I need to just kind of take a siesta and just kind of slow down and not be running out there and pioneering and building things. But there's another time when I have to do it. Why? If I'm not going, I stop growing in my gift mix. I'm a pioneer. Whenever there's no fight spiritually, I don't see any need for me on the planet. True story. Took me years to get over that. I was casting devils out. I would jump, go right to where they're doing their little hocus pocus on the ground and jump right in the middle of it. Tell them about Christ. I'd go to witches and cast demons out of them. All these things. I'd go and pioneer. I'd preach in any crevice, crack you could, I would go. One time I prayed for a man in the bathroom over in Hanford. The power God hit him, dropped him in the Denny's bathroom like smack. Up against the door, so I was stuck. I couldn't even get out. And I, all I could do is stand there. This dude was huge. Muscled up. And I just... Turn the water on. Right? True story. I walked out, and because it sounded like I hit him, because he hit the door. I walked out, and, and I'd been preaching in a conference that night, and I'm walking, people look. <laughs> then they saw how big he was, and I was like, that's right. <laughs> no. <laughs> so we sit down at the table, and somebody came over and said, Pastor, you'll not believe this. I was at your meeting tonight, and this and this and this you said. 
and you didn't know it was me, I was dealing with that. See, you never know who's listening. You never know who's encountering the Spirit of God on your life. Do you hear me? That man got hit by, by heaven in the bathroom. He probably didn't go in there expecting that. He probably just wanted to go in there and do his thing, right? But God showed up. Let me give this wisdom to you. Know when to and know when not to. That's maturity. Does that make sense? How do you know? Holy Spirit will tell you. Holy Spirit will let you know. He will teach you. Moving on. So we're not those that camp around personalities and, and what used to be in previous movements of the body of Christ. We honor and respect those things, but we're always looking forward to moving on and growing in what God has for us today and tomorrow. The next generation is not based on age. You need to get this. The next generation is not built on age. Have you ever watched Star Trek, The Next Generation? There's some old farts on there. There's some young whippersnappers on there. There's some middle-aged people on there, right? Why? The next generation is not built on age. We give them a title. Oh, you're millennials. Oh, you're this. Oh, you're that. Hey, I've met some old duffers that could outrun me any day of the week. I got to serve in one of their ministries. Burn out 30-year-olds. He ran with such intensity, taking the gospel around the world. I desire to do that in my older age. That's going to be some time off down the road because I'm so young. But the reality is it's not based on age. Here's what it's based on. It's based on inspiration, revelation, and birthright. Through birthright, even in your mature age, when we're gray, we can still have young vigor and be relevant. Do you hear me? How's that? Look at Joan Rivers. I swear I never saw that lady get past 40. If she can do that to her outer shell, don't tell me you can't do that to your inner shell, your spirit, man. It doesn't know time boundaries. It is. Amen? Some of us need to learn this. We're in Christ. Live and be. Stop getting this worked up thing in your mind. Live and be in Christ. And that's what makes you fruitful. Amen? Enjoy the journey. Moving on. The word Jordan here in the Hebrew is yadain or yadain, which means this. It's the principal river out of Palestine. We know that. But it descends. When you and I are facing Jordan, what happens is it's coming from a higher point, but it's moving downward. And we usually start at a high point with hope, faith, we can cross it. But because we start looking at all what it will take and all the possibilities, and you know, this thing could just wash us down river. What happens? Our faith starts to diminish. Our hope diminishes, and then we descend. When you descend, your enemy ascends over your life. You're either on your rampart or you're his doormat. Which one is it? That's how it works. If you never cross over Jordan, those things which descend to you are descendant to you or limit you. Now, let me give you something about generational curses. Those are for the unbeliever. The believer, it's all one blessing. Believers should not be meddling in these generational curses. There's a generational blessing because I received Christ and I've been engrafted into the body, watch, and into the faith of Father Abraham. Abraham. 